This video is going to give a brief overview of what clinical prediction rules are. Unfortunately, studies have shown that doctors just aren't very accurate at guessing the probabilities of disease, and we do even worse at guessing the prognosis of a given disease. So, for example, think about somebody you saw with cirrhosis. How accurate could it be if they asked you how long they were going to live? How accurate of an answer could you give them? It's very difficult to us to make these predictions. So clinical prediction rules help us become more accurate at estimating diagnostic and prognostic probabilities. And what they really are are just tools that quantify the individual contributions of elements of the history and physical examination, basic laboratory tests, toward either making a diagnosis or a prognosis. And so it isn't all the elements in the history of a given disease. It's very selective ones, as we'll see, that are predictive um, of either a diagnosis or a prognosis. Now, clinical prediction rules, I think, are most useful for complex decision making. So, for example, someone comes in with symptoms of a pulmonary embolus, but you worry that it could be something else. So how do you decide when it's appropriate to get a D-dimer or when you go to more advanced testing like a um, CT angiography or a VQ scan? It's also useful in something I call high stakes clinical decision making. So for example, a pulmonary embolus has high clinical stakes. If I miss it, somebody could die. Um, I don't want to miss things, so I want to be as accurate as I can in determining uh, their probability before I do any further testing of a pulmonary embolus. So another useful thing of clinical prediction rules. And then they often provide us opportunities to save money uh, without compromising patient care. For example, um, the Ottawa ankle rules were designed so that not everybody who came into the emergency room who potentially sprained or broke their ankle would get an x-ray. Um, if patients um, were very low risk by the Ottawa ankle rules, they got no further testing and it was found that those folks did just fine. They didn't miss fractured ankles. So these are the three uses, I think, of clinical prediction rules, and probably most commonly I use them to determine pretest probability of disease. But really, we use lots of clinical prediction rules if you think about it. These are some of the ones that I'm sure you recognize the names of. So everybody's calculated a TIMI score for acute coronary syndromes. Lots of you use either CURB-65 or PSI scores for pneumonia and so forth. Um, some of the diagnostic ones that you all commonly use are the Wells rules for DVT and PE and so on. And there's this um, shady character, Dr. Centaur here, who has um, criteria that he developed to detect um, streptococcal pharyngitis. So in general, how clinical prediction rules are, are developed are these three steps, um, deriving the rule, validating it, and then importantly, in the end, doing impact analysis. What this level of evidence means down here is that the lower the level of evidence, actually, the better is the evidence supporting that clinical prediction rule. So often when you read papers, um, or a chapter in, say, an evidence-based textbooks like Dynamed, um, maybe up to date, um, they might report a level of evidence of that clinical prediction rule, and this is what they're talking about. So let's first look at derivation of a clinical prediction rule. And here you just construct a list of potential predictors for whatever outcome you're interested in predicting, whether it's a diagnostic probability or a prognostic tool. And then you look at a group of patients and you try to see what predictors are present, and then you look at the outcomes that they have, and then you do some statistical testing to see what's powerfully and statistically significantly associated with the outcome. And the reason I put powerfully here is because we really want some component of a prediction rule to really predict and be important for determining the outcome. Uh, we don't want it to be very weakly associated because it won't be very useful. The next step after we've derived our prediction rule is we need to validate it. We need to make sure it really does predict what we think it's going to predict. And there's two types of validation, narrow validation and broad validation. And I'll mention a little bit more of this in a minute. But for validation, we want to make sure that if we use the prediction rule over and over, it leads to the same results. It gives us the same probabilities. So, and this is important because with every study that we do, and developing a clinical prediction rule is a type of study, there's the role of chance. And if we repeat the study again, we'll find that, oops, this thing wasn't really predictive of a diagnosis. So the other problem in the second bullet here is that predictors can be idiosyncratic to who you derive them on and may not be very predictive in anybody else. So we need to make sure that it doesn't just work in who it was derived on because it's going to work in them. Uh, we need to make sure it works on other people. And so ideally what we want to do is to derive our rule and then test it prospectively in a new population uh, with a different spectrum of disease. Some people with the disorder we're interested in, a lot of them won't have the disorder we're interested in. We want early disease, late disease, etc. We want a very broad spectrum of disease. And we want a variety of different people and a variety of different institutions to test our new rule. 
And so unfortunately a lot of um, clinical prediction rules just undergo narrow, narrow validation and what they'll do is take a population of people say from the emergency room say they got a thousand patients they'll break them up into two groups of 500 and the first 500 they'll derive the rule and the second 500 they'll test the rule. That's the minimum amount of validation that we would um, accept. What we like to see is that that rule after it's been derived is tested in a different setting with different patients, different clinicians. And we see a lot more of this um, but what I would really like to see is the final step which is called impact analysis and in impact analysis what we do is to see does this rule actually change behavior and so the Ottawa rules are a great example of impact analysis they were tested to see if they could reduce the use of imaging and then they followed those people to make sure that nothing adversely happened to them and importantly they gave physicians the information of the rule, of the rule to see how they would um, adjust their practice um, the Wells rule for pulmonary embolism has always been always already been tested in this fashion also in the, what's called the Christopher study um, but not a lot of clinical prediction rules ever go, undergo impact analysis which is um, the ultimate way to determine if the rule is useful clinically. We're going to spend some time in this first journal club critically appraising a clinical prediction rule. I've also attached um, uh, an article on how to do this from the user's guides. These are the methodologic standards for the derivation phase of a clinical prediction rule and there's also a set of methodologic standards for the validation phase of a clinical prediction which we'll do in the next journal club.